Friday started in the most exciting way. I willingly accepted gentle touches, sinking into comfort, propping my head with a pillow. The previous evening, Jeanette, my faithful wife of three years, and I had engaged in a passionate lovemaking that lasted for two blissful hours. With each passing minute, our bond grew deeper, and Jeanette took the initiative, guiding us to a more intense meeting. Finally, having achieved complete satisfaction, we both basked in the serene afterglow, enjoying the fact that life gives us complete satisfaction. That's how our Friday started. Both Jeanette and I decided to take the day off. Jeanette also planned to take a day off on Monday. As my vacation was coming to an end, we returned on Sunday evening so that I could start work on Monday. We were going to the mountains to spend an exciting ski weekend. On this adventure, we were accompanied by Jeanette's closest friend Tatiana and her husband Steve. Together, we rented a cozy house just five miles from the ski resort. This is not the first time we went on such a trip. A year ago, we had a similar experience. As if the company wasn't interesting enough, another couple joined us on Saturday, which further increased the excitement. It is worth noting that Tatiana held a special place in Jeanette's heart. She was a bridesmaid at their weddings, which took place a month after each other. The bond between these two wonderful women was unbreakable, and they supported each other on their special days. Steve, on the other hand, was a classic high school athlete, although he did not possess any outstanding talents that could advance him in life. It seemed that his conversations always boiled down to memories of the glory days. I could probably compete with him in terms of home runs, game-winning goals, and touchdowns. Interestingly, Jeanette and Tatiana were good athletes during their school years. They were prominent on the volleyball and basketball teams. Their physical characteristics were very similar. Both were about six feet tall and slim in build. Perhaps because Tatiana has to hear Steve's stories much more often than mine, she looks into the distance while he tells his stories. But it is important to note that I was also actively involved in school sports. For three years in a row, I served as the starting quarterback on the junior team, but high school students are not allowed to participate in the junior varsity team, so I turned my attention to college. Despite the fact that Steve has a college degree, I would never have thought of hiring him. In fact, all four people have a higher level of education. My thesis work has not been completed yet, which may lead to a delay. According to my mentor, I have to sketch out a 60-page A-rank plan, Although I have already prepared a draft, it may be burdensome for me. Most likely, this is how it should be. Having a supervisor is of great importance to employers. Don't forget to bring your golf clubs to make room for groceries. Of course, sir. Any other requests, sir? Charming, just do it. I headed for the garage. When the garage door opened, a flickering light under the car caught my attention. Since I changed the oil recently, I decided to inspect it. I picked up the folded tarp, unwrapped it, and laid it on the hard ground. As I knelt down, my gaze fell on a few drops under the oil pan. Curious, I carefully felt the liquid with my finger, immediately recognizing the oil in it. It seems that it turned out to be more difficult than expected to make sure that the drain plug was firmly fixed. Getting out from under the car, I quickly took out a set of end heads and positioned myself closer to the target. Without mistakes, I turned the bolt, tightening it by about half a turn. A sense of relief finally came. But my momentary satisfaction was abruptly interrupted when I realized that I had forgotten to bring a paper towel with me. Sighing with annoyance, I decided to fix the situation once again. The problem was solved through an exchange of opinions. I replaced the tarp and then went inside to wash my hands. Are you ready to leave? Not really. I need to get myself cleaned up first. What happened? They couldn't make the bolt for the oil pan. They can offer inexpensive options, but we have to monitor their work. Please hurry up, otherwise we will arrive late. Understood, sir. As a result, I got a stern look, accompanied by tightly compressed lips. At the grocery store next to the cottage, we met Tatiana and Steve. Although calling it nearby would be a stretch, given the distance of 10 miles. 
Their shopping gave the impression that they were going to stay for a long time. Their two overflowing carts were a very impressive sight. When I opened the trunk, I noticed that my golf clubs were still there, despite the fact that I had asked Dale to put them away. The back seat was cluttered with sleeping bags and suitcases, as well as a chaotic assortment of groceries. Only a handful of bags fit in the trunk. Jeanette remained silent during the last leg of our journey to the hut. As soon as we arrived, we wasted no time unloading the cars. I took the initiative and started unloading our stuff from the back seat. After making several passes, Tatiana and I returned to the cars. With our hands full, we walked past Jeanette and Steve. Tatiana quickly took the last bag of groceries out of the car, and I heard the trunk slam shut. I fell a little behind Tatiana as she headed for my car. When I reached it, I noticed that the trunk was already open, and there were two packages in it that still needed to be taken out. A deafening explosion reached us from afar. Tatiana and I turned our gaze to the towering mountain, watching the beginning of a modest avalanche. I have already observed this phenomenon twice. Snow cascaded down for about 10 seconds, and then abruptly stopped. But this case was unlike any other. The initial phenomenon, which covered about 20 feet, quickly grew into a colossal mass stretching for several hundred feet. Her approach could be heard like the steady hum of an approaching train. In a panic, we realized that she was moving in our direction. Hurry up! Get in the car! We exclaimed, rushing to take shelter in the safety of our car. Slamming the trunk shut, I hurriedly closed it and quickly got into the driver's seat. Tatiana quickly joined me, taking the passenger seat in the car. An alarming noise was approaching, instilling fear in both of us. Our eyes widened in horror as the towering snow mountain approached. Bracing myself for the impending collision, I buried my head in the steering wheel, desperately trying to find some kind of shelter. Meanwhile, Tatiana instinctively pulled her knees up to her chest, curling up into a protective ball. The impact shook our car like a puck sliding on ice. It seemed like an eternity had passed, although in fact there was only a minute left before the collision with an unyielding solid object. At that moment, Time seemed to blur, and a wave of horror swept over me as I thought about the fragility of life itself. At some point I was startled by Tatiana's shrill scream, similar to the scream of a teenager experiencing an exciting descent from a roller coaster. At the same moment, my heart began to beat so hard that it seemed as if my chest was about to burst. I could feel my pulse going over a hundred beats per minute, which caused a throbbing headache. In total darkness, a wave of relief swept over me when I realized that I was still alive. Worried about Tatiana's well-being, I asked her, Are you alright, Tatiana? In response, she hesitantly replied, I think it's okay, just a little headache. Feeling a peculiar imbalance, she confessed, It feels like we're tilting. Confirming her remark, I agreed, Indeed your side seems elevated compared to mine. Deciding to restore visibility, I found a switch and quickly flipped it. Tatiana expressed concern, remarking, You have blood right above your right eye. Please check yourself. Embarrassed, I replied with a laugh. And what exactly should I check? I have beautiful hair, a slim figure, and a sweet smile. I playfully reassured her, I'm not bleeding, at least not where I can see. Tatiana's cheeks turned red, and we sat in silence for a few moments. I tried to open the door but we were pressed tightly together. It was pitching black outside and there was no snow. As we peered into the dim lighting, a wide opening appeared next to the front right wheel. Limited visibility did not prevent us from noticing the presence of tall trees that formed a natural canopy over us. This unusual hole could provide us with enough oxygen, which would guarantee our survival for several days. But to do this, we needed to ensure proper ventilation by running a fan to circulate carbon dioxide. It is worth noting that the threat to life is not the lack of oxygen, but the accumulation of carbon dioxide to a deadly level. By the way, did you by any chance bring the last bag of groceries with you? Tatiana shook her head, indicating the absence of the package, and then asked, Do you think Steve and Jeanette handled it? I have no idea. 
I've never seen the destruction caused by an avalanche of this magnitude before. A heavy feeling settled in my chest. The thought that Jeanette had not survived weighed on me. Tears welled up in my eyes and I quickly wiped them away. Tatiana seemed to be experiencing the same emotions. I don't think we can say we survived, can we? Not before we can breathe in the warmth of the sun's rays. It's unpleasant to think that no one will understand that we are trapped under the snow. I honked the horn, and to my relief, it worked. Finally, we have a means of notifying rescuers. We decided that every hour or whenever we feel any activity, we will give a quick beep. Time passed, and for an hour we sat in almost complete silence. Then Tatiana broke the silence with a statement that made a splash in me. I don't want to die. I couldn't disagree, feeling the gravity of the situation. I was gripped by the realization that this could be my last day on Earth. Despite the lack of a telephone connection, I decided to record sincere texts in which I expressed my love for the people I care about. It's a great idea, but unfortunately I didn't have a phone handy. I want to. You can use my phone, I said, and my fingers tapped on the screen for almost 10 minutes until I was overwhelmed by a wave of emotions. Handing the phone to Tatiana, she also felt the same way. For the next couple of hours we exchanged the device with each other, each composing numerous messages from the other world. But in the end, there was silence. There was no answer. Fortunately, the battery held up very well, and during breaks we tried to save energy by turning off the overhead light. A slight chill seized me and Tatiana became worried. It's a pity we didn't empty the trunk in advance. The sleeping bags were left untouched in the back seat, but I found a solution to how to access the trunk, by folding the back seats. Armed with winter gloves, a raincoat, and potentially a windbreaker, I carefully made my way to the back seat to find the latch. Fortunately, it worked flawlessly. Guided by the lighting of the mobile phone, I carefully stuck my head into the trunk. After a few moments, we put on gloves, hats, coats, and raincoats, fully prepared for the bad weather. Without delay, I quickly took out the last two bags of groceries. Frozen cauliflower and potato chips stood out among other products. It was nice to know that we wouldn't stay hungry. Remembering that I had a couple of energy drinks stashed in my golf bag, I took them out of the trunk. I laughed heartily when I saw Tatiana dressed in a golf suit. It definitely added warmth to the situation. Would you like a stick of celery? I asked, holding out my hand to her. If you don't mind, she replied, I'll make an exception for you. I settled into the back seat and stretched out more comfortably. Tatiana changed into the remaining golf suit and set the passenger seat to the lowest position. Expressing her disappointment, she noted the lack of a blanket. But then, an idea struck her, and she remembered the little towels she usually used to clean the clubs. Offering to use these towels to cover her face, Tatiana suggested spreading mats in the car for extra warmth. Despite the limited resources, we followed Tatiana's suggestion. Each of us took a towel and threw it over himself, taking care to cover his face as well. Surprisingly, this improvised solution brought much needed relief from the cold. Closing my eyes and wanting to rest, I woke up to the realization that two hours had passed unnoticed while I was doing. Tatiana was making a gentle purr, a sound that women often use to portray their snoring. In order not to wake her, I preferred to lie still, immersed in thoughts about the state of my life and the current predicament in which we found ourselves. The thought of us dying was unbearable. Would we be discovered before the spring thaw? Could it be that we die just an hour before they stumble upon us? Despair would undoubtedly have gripped my mother if we hadn't been found in time. As for Jeanette, I could only hope that she had managed to survive. Tatiana woke up with a piercing scream. Don't worry, Tatiana, I'm here, I reassured her, feeling her suffering. You had a nightmare, it's just a dream. Tatiana's eyes widened with fear when she told me about her dream. I saw us, our skeletons in the car. I'm terribly afraid of dying. 
Feeling the need to comfort her without asking Tatiana's permission, I made my way to the back seat. The warmth emanating from her presence was strangely comforting, and I couldn't deny the sense of relief it brought. Curious about the time, I asked, What time is it now? My voice was soft. It's a little after seven in the evening. The sun had already set almost two hours ago. That's why it's getting colder. Tatiana's anxiety became more and more obvious as she doubted her fate. Are we going to starve? Are we going to freeze? Is there a chance of oxygen starvation? I believe that we are fine in all respects, except for the risk of freezing. It would be useful to have access to water. When I tried to start the car, I found that the driver's side window was stuck, but the passenger windows managed to be lowered by a few inches. I checked to see if they could be raised again, and then lowered them again. To quench our thirst, we took advantage of the situation and ate some snow. With determination, we managed to make a hole in the dark. Fortunately, we had a sufficient supply of oxygen. After working on the fan for a while, I decided to close the windows again. The horn continued to ring, and I couldn't help but ask if anyone in the distance guessed the source of the noise. Tatiana voiced the same thought as me, about the need to visit the restroom. I agreed, and we both started looking for possible options. When I was watching the car, it seemed to me that its left front wheel was tilting. I volunteered to drive next, but someone jokingly accused me of dementia. Ignoring this remark, I suggested capturing this moment by taking out a camera and recording a video. If you continue like this, you will be fatal due to severe beatings. There were unpleasant odors and echoes of urine in the car. After catching her breath, Tatiana reluctantly returned to the passenger seat. I reluctantly took a seat at the wheel. I relieved myself, started the engine, and rolled down the window. Using the open window, I turned on the fan to circulate the air. Despite our plight, we tried to get settled for the night. We didn't move for what seemed like an eternity, considering our next steps. Tatiana asked if I would behave myself. She asked if I wanted her to complete a certain task. My own desires and obligations, which I am aware of at the moment, differ significantly. In order not to be accused of constantly harassing her all night, I think it would be better if you hug me. Tatiana settled into the back seat, leaning on the back, and beckoned me closer. She asked me to cuddle up to her because she was cold. Tatiana gently put her right hand on my chest, pulling me to her. The warmth emanating from her body enveloped me, creating an incredibly pleasant feeling. At the same time, anxiety arose in me. I was afraid that her hand might drop lower, revealing my discomfort. Under the cover of golf towels draped over our faces, we eventually succumbed to the embrace of sleep. Time slipped away from my consciousness as drowsiness took hold of both of us. Suddenly, Tatiana pushed me away, and I moved back, watching her take her place in the driver's seat. The familiar sounds and smells of urine permeated the car's atmosphere again. Checking the time, I found that it was almost five in the morning. Tatiana and I hugged each other again, not wanting to let go of each other and fall asleep. The question of Jeanette's possible demise arose, and I was puzzled. Would I have to leave or stay here if she passed away? And what will happen to us? In response, I admitted that I would most likely seek comfort from my parents until I recovered from my grief. Curiosity lingered when we wondered how much time we had left. Grinning, I estimated that it was about a week. We currently have a sufficient supply of water and perhaps enough food for another three or four days. It is difficult to assess the oxygen level. Are there any searches underway to find us, considering that we are contacting the highway department, I hope so. I snuggle closer to Tatiana, feeling her hand gently creep under my shirt. The feeling of skin touching skin brings a pleasant warmth. We talk for hours, touching on a variety of topics. After snacking on a few potato chips and finishing the remaining celery, we lay down and fall asleep. When I wake up, I find myself lying completely still. Tatiana let out a soft purr, and I looked at my watch, realizing that it was almost five o'clock in the evening. Suddenly, 
a faint, barely discernible knock reached my ears. Tatiana, did you hear that? I whispered urgently. In response, there were three quick beeps, then three long ones, and three more fast ones. Tatiana chuckled softly. Her anticipation was obvious. Please let it be so, I asked quietly. We were silent for a minute, our senses heightened. Then we both caught the sound of knocking. Without hesitation, I repeated the distress signal, saying, So S. Suddenly, there was a wonderful moment of triumph when their pole with the probe came into contact with the car. My hand instinctively pressed down on the horn, not wanting to let go until the pole hit the car again. Despite the realization that salvation was imminent, every second only increased my growing anxiety. Why does it take so excruciatingly long? Tatiana clung to me for comfort, and I leaned back in the driver's seat, desperately hoping for at least some signs of progress. From time to time, another probe collided with the car, increasing our expectation. And so, like a symphony of hope, we heard distant voices assuring us that help was almost within reach. Hold on, they urged. The ringing clang of metal on metal has never been so pleasant. It meant the approaching salvation that awaited us. I honked again, piercing the silence. A ray of light from a miner's lantern pierced the thick snow cover. An elderly gentleman, tightly wrapped in layered clothes, greeted us with a wide grin. He resolutely began to clear the snow that had blocked the driver's door. Despite my attempts to open it, the snow still got in the way. After a few more minutes of vigorous shoveling, I felt the door slowly give way. Soon there was the sound of his shovel hitting the door, and my door swung open a few inches. Overwhelmed with gratitude, I repeated the words of gratitude over and over again. The man replied modestly, nothing special. When we got to the surface, Tatiana and I were greeted by darkness. About 20 people were standing there, and their mining helmets illuminated the scene. They kindly covered us with warm blankets, handed us each a bottle of refreshing water, and securely fastened us to the sled. Suddenly the question arose, is the house still intact? Confused, I asked, which house? My heart was pounding with uncertainty. Finally, I managed to pronounce the address where we were staying. Without delay, he relayed my information through the microphone, repeating it for everyone to see. After a short conversation, he returned to us again, as we could not find the house in the dark, but we promised to come back in the morning. Worried about your well-being? We offered to take you both to the hospital as you were buried under 15 feet of snow. When we heard your car beep at the beginning of the day, we decided to work hard all night. Are you ready? Tatiana clung to me tightly, her arms wrapped securely around my waist, and we were escorted to the ambulance. After a comfortable trip, we arrived at the emergency room, which attracted close attention. I had to sew up a wound above my right eyebrow evidence of the severity of our injuries. But hypothermia had not yet reached a critical stage, as evidenced by the absence of alarming symptoms. Despite this, we were hospitalized overnight, where we received the necessary medications and gradually restored our body temperature to normal levels. The next morning, Tatiana was discharged first, but she patiently waited for my discharge. I talked to the ambulance staff, who found a hut nearby with signs of human habitation. My heart was filled with joy at this discovery. I turned Tatiana around, and she bent down to kiss me on the cheek. When I asked her why, she called me a real gentleman and admired my calmness. She admitted that she would not have coped with the situation on her own. We both admitted that things would have been different if Steve had been there. He would have been completely confused. I thanked her for her appreciation, and she thanked me in return. She admitted that my ability to stay calm helped her a lot. We discussed who was in charge of the rescue, and I mentioned that I had found a guy in the cafeteria who seemed to have set up a command center there. Come on, let's go. The next two hours were excruciatingly long. There was silence among the search party. It was around 12.30 when we finally got the latest news. The person in charge informed us that only two people managed to survive. The walls collapsed, and heavy machinery had to be used. 
It seems that they were lucky enough to find shelter in a place that was not completely destroyed. Can you estimate how long it will take you to get to them? Will you be able to get there at all? It's too early to judge that. My head started spinning. Fortunately, they are both still breathing. I urge you to be careful with the bulldozers and not cause them further harm. After several long waits, we finally received his message a few hours later. Fortunately, both managed to get out unharmed. They are expected to arrive in the next half hour. Tears welled up in my eyes from the emotions that overwhelmed me. Grateful for our safety, Tatiana and I hugged again. I hurriedly dialed the number of each of my relatives, telling them about what had happened. No one knew that the avalanche caught us by surprise during a ski trip. Now this news has caused excitement for everyone. That's when I met Janet Stretcher. Tatiana and Steve shared the same emotional reunion, their eyes filled with tears. It was only after lunch that we were allowed to enter their rooms. We spent the first 10 minutes clinging tightly to each other, whispering sweet words and declaring our love. Hi baby, how was your weekend? I asked, to which she replied, there was a lot of snow. I nodded, acknowledging the presence of a few snowflakes. The sounds of her giggling sounded like pleasant music in my ears, and her kisses radiated warmth, and her hugs were simply heavenly. Tatiana and I managed to get safely into my car a moment before it all happened, but we were wondering if you were alive. It was just luck. Suddenly, a deafening roar reached our ears, followed by an explosive boom. Everything turned into chaos. At that moment, we were sorting things out in the kitchen when the impact occurred. In those terrible moments, I sincerely believed that my life was over. But when the noise subsided, I realized that I had somehow survived. Darkness enveloped us, and in the silence I could hear Steve moaning in pain. We were trapped in a cramped room with only about three feet of free space. It was pure luck that we survived in such a difficult situation. As for the provisions, did you manage to get any food or blankets? There was a handful of apples and a worn rug on the floor. The fear of starving to death or freezing to death occupied all our thoughts. The only things we had were thick parkas and a scanty carpet. My body was covered with numerous small cuts and scratches, and Steve had badly sprained his ankle. How long will we be detained? At least for the night, our body temperatures have dropped to dangerously low levels. The nurse expressed doubt that we have a chance to survive another night. At the right moment, I hugged and kissed Janet before the visitors were kindly asked to leave. Be sure to get some sleep. I'm going to go home and pick up your car. Besides, I'll get some fresh clothes for you. Jeanette nodded in agreement. But then a sudden panic seized her and she begged, Dale, please just leave them. I don't want these things to serve as a reminder to you. I can get rid of them myself. Her hands reached for the package I was holding. Trying to calm her down, I replied, Honestly, Jeanette, it's not a problem. You won't even remember that it was your clothes. Everything is practically new. I understand everything. Dale, could you give them to me? I will be very grateful. Get some rest. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Dale, hand me that bag, please. Jeanette, you look very worried. Get some sleep and we'll catch up in the morning. It's weird. I think she would have fought me if she had the chance. Strange. I was waiting for Tatiana and, as expected, the elevator took her to the hall. How is he behaving? I must say, quite immature. He doesn't take surprises well. And how is Jeanette? I think she's doing well. She was furious when she found out that I was going to return her clothes. She just wanted to throw them away to erase any reminder of the hard experience. People deal with difficulties in different ways. It seemed unusual to me. She didn't seem to want me to see anything. I agree. And you? What did I do wrong? Did you throw away her clothes? No. Everything was left in the bag. May I? Tatiana cast a secret glance. Their expressions instantly changed. Her eyes became intense and unflappable. How terrible. They were engaged in intimacy. Just look at the condition of her trousers. They're disgustingly sticky. 
Obviously, this has happened more than once. I'm furious. I want to destroy him. Tatiana abruptly dropped her bag and rushed to the stairs, slamming the door behind her. I was left in shock and disbelief. How could she tolerate this? She showed no signs of sacrifice. Overwhelmed with emotion, I sank into a chair. My heart broke, and my vision blurred from tears. Rage began to consume me. Ten minutes later, Tatiana, accompanied by security personnel, returned to the lobby. Ten feet away, one of the guards warned her to behave herself, threatening to kick her out if she did not comply with his demands. He spoke about their fear of impending demise, but refrained from clarifying the frequency of such cases. When I asked, he just replied, several times. Besides, they didn't know if they would survive. Disappointment overwhelmed me, causing an inexplicable desire to face something. I could hardly remember a time when my anger reached such heights. After a short moment of silence, tears began to flow down our faces. When the phone rang, I received a notification that the Uber would arrive in two minutes. Sensing the anguish in her voice, I suggested, You can come with me. I'll take you home. She nodded silently, but her tears betrayed her emotions. The next hour passed in awkward silence, a painful reminder that we were both in common pain. When she got home, Tatiana bent down and kissed me gently on the cheek, muttering, Hold on, Dale. Grateful for the weekend we spent together, I replied, And to you, Tatiana, thank you for a pleasant time. A glimmer of a smile broke through her tears, and she whispered, I will always remember only you. The road home was overshadowed by sadness, which reflected the emotions that gripped us. A wave of emotions swept over me, flooding my thoughts. Thoughts of anger, hugs, separation, forgiveness, and in the end the question why. Sleep eluded me, refusing to give me comfort. Since dawn I have carefully completed all the necessary tasks. Having refreshed myself, I entered my office, ready to face the day. After telling about the events of the weekend, I got a day off for today and tomorrow. I'm back, restored. In the midst of my actions, I rummaged through Jeanette's wardrobe and pulled out a pair of sweatpants and matching underwear. Anger came over me. I felt a strong surge of emotions. Disappointment overwhelmed me when I started another search. On the previous Halloween, she decided to wear a provocative outfit similar to a stripper costume. I came across it, as well as a lace thong. This finding seemed appropriate to me. Taking advantage of the fact that her drawers were open, I decided to move her things to the bedroom in the study, giving her the opportunity, if desired, to rearrange and create a sleeping sofa. Back in our shared bedroom, I gathered up her unmistakably feminine toiletries and threw them in the trash. Finally, I put the trash can next to her clothes. It took me a while to get up the courage to enter Jeanette's room. Her parents and sister showered her with affection, and there were traces of sadness and tears in her eyes. After exchanging hugs and kisses with my relatives, I became fixated on Jeanette, grieving for her. At first I felt an irresistible desire to vent my anger on her, but soon a gentle embrace replaced these cruel thoughts. Is this really all I have left? I silently nodded in agreement, confirming that she understood my unspoken words. Her trembling lower lip betrayed her emotions. Will you be discharged today? I think so, I replied, expressing my appreciation for the IVs and cozy blankets. Despite the unattractive taste of their food, I wanted more. Jeanette seemed uncomfortable, avoiding my eyes. I'm going to get some coffee, I said, trying to dispel the awkwardness. Offering to help, Jeanette's father, Fred, interjected, Can I buy something for someone? After accepting my company, he replied, Of course I'll join you, son. When we reached the cafeteria, Fred met my gaze with concern. What's going on, Dale? I thought that after the ordeal you both went through, you should have developed feelings for each other. Fred, I have to make it clear that our situation at home is far from ideal. Jeanette will explain her point of view to you, and she behaved abominably. Unfortunately, this is the reality we are facing, 
and I am at a loss what to do. When we entered the room, carrying a tray with cups of coffee and donuts, tears were streaming down Jeanette's face. As soon as we finished eating, Fred gathered his family and left. Before I could talk to Jeanette, her doctor came and told her to get ready for discharge. Jeanette took the bag of clothes I brought her. Very quickly, I went to the bathroom. Will you let me wear this outfit? Your behavior and outfit suggest promiscuity. I thought you and I agreed to refrain from making love until Monday. Unfortunately, many of our promises have been broken by insurmountable circumstances. Her face contorted in anguish as she fell into the bathroom and sobbed for about 30 minutes. Jeanette appeared in this outfit, and Cher's voice cracked when she spoke. Are you happy with this? Far from it. Let's leave. When the nurse brought the wheelchair, a sincere sense of awe was reflected on her face. I got out of the car to give her a ride to the entrance, and all eyes were on Jeanette as she gracefully rose from her wheelchair and headed for the passenger door. I refrained from offering help, knowing that she was capable of it. The trip took place in complete silence for about five minutes, during which we reflected on the difficulties of my life. We couldn't help but reflect on our own experiences, but we were determined not to let them cloud our existence. These reflections brought tears to my eyes again. What's next? Your things are still in the office. She sobbed softly the rest of the way. As soon as we arrived at the house, she plucked up the courage and whispered, I feel guilty. I shared that feeling too, feeling terrible. Since my car was completely wrecked, I started the procedure of attracting an insurance company. I bought a temporary car, and on the way back it dawned on me that it was undesirable to be in Jeanette's company at the moment. I decided to send her a message telling her not to wait. I'm currently away from home and I can't figure out the situation, don't wait for me. But I got a quick response from her. I'm begging you, Dale, to come home so we can talk. We need to communicate if we want to find a solution. It's too early to start any active discussion right now. I spent the evening yesterday watching college basketball games and NHL hockey in a sports bar. Interestingly, Devoted husbands are often associated with certain smells. A few hours later, a waitress came up to me and asked me how I was coping with my wife's infidelity. She warned me against trying to drown my problems in alcohol. I agreed with her advice. Jeanette was already waiting for me when I arrived, exhausted and drunk, around 1.30 a.m. Her face showed concern as she began to worry about my well-being. My response, slurred and indistinct, indicated that I was trying to brush off her concern by insisting that I was fine. Waving away her affectionate gestures, I closed the bedroom door behind me and collapsed onto the bed, seeking comfort in her arms. The next morning when I woke up, I was greeted by a note from Jeanette. It talked about her absence because she had already left for work, but it also informed about her love for me. The familiar surroundings of our house only increased my anger, reminding me of countless cherished memories. Unable to stand the emotions that overwhelmed me, I decided to leave home. I needed to take my mind off the reminders that fueled my anger. Will you be back by nine? Are you coming home today? Dinner is ready. It was too early for me. I decided to take a break for food and eventually arrived around 10 p.m., I had to go to work the next morning, and I couldn't risk a hangover. When I came in, Jeanette was snuggled up on the couch in her sweatpants. For the first time since Monday, her eyes weren't swollen and red. We needed to have a serious conversation. I begged her not to shut her out. I asked, what is there to talk about? Did you really think you were going to die? It seems that you have entered into a dangerous, intimate relationship with the intention of harming each other. But there seems to be a misunderstanding. Let me explain. Tatiana and I had deep conversations about death, focusing solely on verbal communication and not on anything intimate. We have encountered problems similar to those that you may have encountered. Are we really similar in this regard? We even thought about the possibility of freezing to death or starving to death. We wondered if our skeletons would be found in the spring, 
when the snow melts. And yet unlike you, we were wondering if each of you would be able to survive. How did our concerns differ from yours? Suddenly, tears welled up in my eyes. Our conversation revolved around you until I came to the conclusion that you are most likely no longer alive. At this moment of vulnerability, the thought of physical intimacy arose. Dale, that wasn't the purpose of all this. So why did this happen? I can't give a definite answer. Perhaps I succumbed to my weakness and fear. I admit that I lack your strength. Will you leave me? Divorce is not what I want. To be honest, I'm not sure. Being close to you gives me goosebumps. The torments of betrayal weigh on me. Can I at least have a hug? Opening her arms, Jeanette quickly wrapped her arms around me, squeezing my ribs tightly. Her tears flowed for several minutes until our hug finally ended. Good night, Jeanette. I'll see you tomorrow, I said quietly. Good night, Dale. I love you, she replied. This was my first encounter with betrayal. If I had faced such a heartache in school or college, I might have realized that a new day would come. But at that moment, uncertainty clouded my mind. I couldn't untangle the confusion inside of me. The transition from imaginary love to simple lust has become apparent in recent days when we found ourselves locked in a dead end. Unfortunately, I cannot contact Tatiana by phone. Is it true that she broke up with Steve? And if so, does this mean that she will leave our company? Did you manage to communicate with Tatiana? Unfortunately, not since she suddenly burst into my room on Monday morning. I decided never to talk to her again because her behavior was far from pleasant. Her words were harsh and unpleasant. She praised you for your gentlemanly behavior and considered you her hero. She told me that you know everything, and that's why I was very upset after your arrival. Did you tell my parents about this? Judging by Fred's immediate reaction, he was suspicious. Not particularly. I was hoping that we could get out of this situation. But given the current circumstances, that seems unlikely, doesn't it? I believed that our love was strong. I just don't feel comfortable in your presence. Something inside me has died. Let's see how the next month goes, and then I'll make a decision. I felt completely empty inside, as if my soul had died. The numbness persisted for four long weeks, even when I was with Jeanette. I couldn't help but wonder what position we were in, and desperately searched for a reason to save our relationship. I accused her of abandoning us, and in my desperation, I made a mistake that will haunt me forever. Although it was not intentional, I cannot deny my responsibility. Jeanette became increasingly upset, denying my claims and insisting that I was wrong. She misled me by saying that as far as she knew, I was the one who was involved with Tatiana. Are you going to play games? Good. How long have you both been in a relationship? I imagine it was a wonderful reunion experience with Steve, right? This may have been the first meeting with Steve, but I can't help but wonder how many previous meetings there have been. Jeanette hugged her knees to her chest and curled up into a ball. Each of my accusations was like a heavy blow to her. Did you use our bedroom or did you stay only in motels? No matter what you did, you successfully kept me in the dark, that's all. Are you satisfied now? Please forgive me, Dale. I deeply regret saying this nonsense. There were never any others, and it was a mistake made in a difficult situation. Can we try to put this in the past? One thing is for sure, Jeanette. Your actions have predetermined our fate. I was hoping for a partner who could resist temptation, but now I realize that you will always be a liar to me. I will always be haunted by the uncertainty that you were looking for alternative circumstances. I'm not going to live like this. I'm too young for this kind of life. I'm going to file for divorce. Oh no, no, oh please, Dale, my love, please, I can't let you go. I don't want to lose you. But I need to move on. I no longer have the feelings for you that I used to have when I was with you. There is only one feeling left. Pain. You shouldn't have broken my heart. I will instruct my lawyer to arrange a divorce. The documents will be delivered to you here. You don't have to take it out in public. There were tears in Jeanette's eyes, 
and her voice trembled as she spoke. The fear that she would not be able to withstand the current situation overwhelmed her. What will happen to our beloved home? I think it's better to sell it. None of us wants to keep him, and I doubt you'll be able to handle him financially. With difficulty restraining herself, she uttered a quiet, Okay. Two days later, Jeanette received the legal documents at home. It was a fair result, considering that our property was limited for partition. I will be required to pay the minimum amount of alimony for the next two years. The divorce was finalized in less than 90 days, as there were no objections. Jeanette tried to convince me to reconsider my decision but I remained firm, perhaps even unwilling to do so. After submitting the documents, I immediately left the house. As expected, since Jeanette couldn't afford the mortgage, the house was sold, and the remaining property was divided equally. At first, Jeanette sought refuge with her parents, but a few months later she moved, and her new location is unknown to me. Whenever she comes to my mind, anger and sadness flare up in me. The idea of getting back at Steve was tempting, but in the end, it had no real value. But if I master Haskell, maybe he will save me from revenge and help me change the perspective. Throughout the divorce process, several of my close friends tirelessly tried to introduce me to suitable women. Despite several dates, I felt emotionally numb. The idea of starting a new relationship turned out to be flat and uninspiring. It's been five months since the avalanche. During this time, I have visited many job fairs, which were held exclusively by invitation. As a result, I received two very attractive job offers. Although I became very attached to my current job, it just couldn't compete with the opportunities that these offers offered. When I discussed my aspirations with my employers, they acknowledged this fact. That's why I took a job on the West Coast, near Palo Alto. Packing things in the car didn't give me any trouble. When I arrived at the new apartment, I found that it was no lonelier than my previous one. Unfortunately, it also did not offer any significant improvements. I longed for a private life in which women would be present. I felt lost, unsure of my true desires in life. But on one of those thoughtful evenings, I was overwhelmed by a wave of memories when I turned back to the text messages I had once written. Their words brought comfort to my tortured soul, expressing love and conveying the depth of my emotions to those who were dear to me turned out to be a source of great joy. At that moment, I decided to go on a journey to live my life as a single person. Although it felt like I was invading someone's personal diary, I understood how important it was to accept this new chapter. I continued to read Tatiana's works one by one, admiring her great creative talent. When I read her heartfelt letter addressed to my mother, my heart began to pound with strong emotions. I may not have married the man I always dreamed of, but I was comforted by the thought that at least I would die in his loving arms. Jeanette, it seems lucky to have a husband. But while trying to contact Tatiana, I ran into a problem. The phone number was no longer functioning. Remembering the conversations that Tatiana and I had while waiting for salvation, I thought I could guess about the city where her parents live. Looking through one of the photo albums, I came across photos from our wedding and a cover letter. This discovery made it possible to find out Tatiana's maiden name and quickly find her parents. I decided to leave a message for her mother and ask her to contact me. Dale? Tatiana, is it really you? I exclaimed excitedly when she picked up the phone. How are you? I've missed you so much. Tatiana happily replied, Oh Dale, I'm incredibly glad you called. I've been waiting for this moment for so long. I'm all good. Now tell me what's going on in your life. After getting my master's degree, I got a job on the West Coast where I lived for only a month. Have you been in touch with Jeanette lately? Unfortunately, we are no longer together, as our divorce was finalized a few months ago. What about you? Are you still in a relationship with Steve? No, like in your situation, we lived together for a couple of months, but we found it too difficult. Oh, I'm incredibly relieved that you called. What prompted you to make this call? Last week I once again indulged in self-pity. 
I came across the poems that we wrote while thinking about my life, and strangely enough, they lifted my spirits. It's amazing how I completely forgot about them. Oh, it dawned on me that you must have been looking through mine too. The man you've been dreaming about, isn't that right? I had no idea. She is my confidant, my closest friend. Such secrets are not revealed between best friends. But please tell me, where are you now? In the bustling city of Chicago. I'm curious, in which place exactly? In Palo Alto. Our office in San Jose is located about 20 miles from Palo Alto, where the airport I usually use is located. I can try to convince my boss to give me permission to visit this office. As an alternative, I can consider a trip to the Windy City. Dale, I'd love to see you. I have no plans for the coming weekend. I know where the airport is so I can easily meet you. Maybe we can consider possible flights for Friday evening? Besides, could you help me find a suitable place to live? Of course, I'll take care of it. Actually, I didn't want any conflicts with your friends. I'll solve them. Are you sure your friends will let me come? If the situation worsens, I will take some companions with me. It sounds like a fantastic plan. I appreciate your wonderful sense of humor, Tatiana. And that's just one of the countless things that I adore about you. Our conversation lasted over 90 minutes, and I was very pleased to hear her voice again. A wave of pleasant memories washed over me, and it became difficult for me not to think about Jeanette. But somehow, I found a way to keep her in my head. Friday came, and I decided to start the working day earlier than usual, leaving around 11 a.m. When I got to Chicago, I texted Tatiana to let her know that I was coming for her. As soon as I saw her, I couldn't contain my excitement and hugged her tightly, spinning her around. The kiss she gave me was the warmest and most precious one I've received this year. I am glad that you were able to do this. Are you hungry? Well... I think I should have a snack. Why don't you take me to your favorite place? Let's go. Don't you want to drive? No, I'm not in the mood. You can take the driver's seat if you need a break. After a delicious dinner at the Texas Roadhouse, Tatiana directed us back to the highway. My heartbeat gradually calmed down a bit. When she arrived at the Holiday Inn parking lot, she noted, My non-resident guests usually stay here. But there was a mischievous gleam in her eyes as she added, But I have something else for you. She added soothingly, Don't worry, it won't hurt if you don't resist, I will persevere. As soon as we entered Tatiana's apartment, she readily hugged me and demanded, Kiss me. Gradually gentle kisses turned into passionate ones. My hands moved, although slower than Tatiana's. Together we gradually helped each other to shed their clothes, the night was filled with numerous passionate encounters. At first, everything unfolded rapidly, because during the absence of partners, we had accumulated a thirst for intimacy. In the end, well-fed and satisfied, we fell asleep after a short break. Our love flared up with renewed vigor. The sun's rays caressed my face, and the sound of water from the shower filled the room. Tatiana appeared with wet hair wrapped in a towel and greeted me affectionately. Good morning, my love. Did you enjoy our night? It was like a dream, and at the same time like reality. I stuck out my tongue playfully. Get up, you lazy man. We have a whole day ahead of us. The weekend was just wonderful. On Sunday evening, we said goodbye, knowing that Tatiana, as planned, would fly to San Jose in two weeks. As my enjoyment came to an end, I couldn't help but notice that feelings for Tatiana were emerging in me. The look on her face during our breakup suggested that she might be experiencing similar feelings. In the middle of the week, we contacted her. Good evening, Tatiana. How is your work week? I asked. Very good, Dale. That's why I came to you. They have a vacancy in the office in San Jose. I have already checked and fulfilled all the necessary requirements. My feelings for you are very strong, but if you don't reciprocate, I will respect your decision and give you freedom. If I admit that I think I've fallen in love with you, will it help you make a choice? Will this revelation affect your thoughts about changing jobs? 
yes I love you and that's why I'm taking this job. Our conversation lasted several hours. I had to find a suitable apartment that would meet our requirements and at the same time be conveniently located near her office, the airport and my own workplace. Having received permission for a new job, I wasted no time preparing my suitcases. Life can sometimes develop rapidly, like an avalanche. Despite the fact that we were in no hurry, we were both tormented by hidden anxieties related to the relationship. Despite the fact that we quarreled periodically, we always found a way to make up by kissing and hugging before going to bed. The fact that Tatiana prefers to go on business trips with men has always bothered me because I communicate closely with many young women. But after 10 months of living together, we finally had a conversation that led to mutual understanding. Tatiana, I sincerely apologize for my previous behavior. Now I realize that I acted stupidly. If you can remain faithful to our vows, even when faced with the temptation to be with a desirable man, then I should have no reason to worry when you go on business trips. Although my distrust of men remains, I urge you to avoid any situations that may put you at risk. Dale, please listen to me. I admit that I acted unfairly and was petty when I mentioned your female colleagues, but you have shown me that, thanks to the avalanche incident, you are the person I can rely on. Although I still have doubts about the women you work with, I am confident in your reliability. We exchanged a silent look for a moment, and then I knelt down. Although I don't have a ring or anything extravagant, since everything happens unexpectedly, I want to know if you want to spend your whole life with me, whether in reality or in dreams. We had a wonderful wedding ceremony in San Jose and went on a honeymoon to a place far from the snowy landscapes. Skiing never attracted us anymore, and we lost all interest in it. Our careers took over the role of our children, until eight years later, Sarah came into our lives. She bears a striking resemblance to her mother. Two years later, her sister Maggie was born, and her future path would have been much more difficult, since she looks strikingly like me. We found out about Steve's remarriage, and that he had fathered one child through social media. Similarly, we learned that Jeanette moved to Maryland, and is now the mother of two children, but she was unlucky in her marriage. The man she married was irresponsible, and often got drunk and beat Jeanette. She had to make a choice, and now she is raising children alone, barely making ends meet. Surprisingly, neither Steve nor Jeanette tried to contact us, and we didn't feel obligated to contact them. These once precious relationships were buried under an inexorable avalanche. As I contemplate the impending infliction of pain on a person who does not deserve it, my thoughts are torn apart. I doubt if I can handle what's going to happen in the next half hour. Looking at the neatly framed photo of Dave and me on our wedding day hanging over the mantelpiece, I look at it with eyes that have exhausted their tears due to the gradual destruction of my once happy 28-year marriage. Every tear shed during this contemplation contributed to my inner conflict over whether to engage in this conversation. Despite the affirmative answer, I still struggle with a strong desire to escape. The thought of how devastated Dave will be weighs on me. Sitting next to me on the couch, John squeezes my hand reassuringly, giving me the courage to face what lies ahead. I look at him from the side, expressing my gratitude with a smile. During our 15-month affair, I gradually fell deeply in love with John, taking every ounce of love from him that was meant for Dave. It was at that moment, when intimacy with my husband seemed to me a betrayal of John, that I began to prepare for this meeting. Despite all this, I can't say that I'm looking forward to it. But I'm looking forward to the upcoming event. I have no choice but to face Dave and deal him a significant blow. However, when this ordeal is over, I can finally stop making a facade of myself. I no longer have to pretend to be deeply in love with Dave despite his obvious affection for me. I can stop pretending to meet my girlfriends, go to work, or go shopping for clothes, but in fact I'm secretly dating John. This double life is incredibly exhausting, and every morning deeper wrinkles appear on my face. Yes, I'm looking forward to seeing her. 
I quickly turn my gaze to the bookcase and make sure that the baseball bat that I had discreetly hidden earlier remained untouched. I'm well aware of Dave's views on loyalty. Since our children moved in, he has immersed himself in reading stories about unfaithful wives receiving fair compensation. I was struck by the intensity of the husband's reactions depicted in some of these stories. Wives did face serious consequences for their actions. When I asked Dave about his fascination with such stories, he calmly replied that listening to these stories made an impression on him. My Dave is usually not prone to cruelty, but when faced with a person who deprives him of happiness and future, he may think about breaking this rule. Dave has a significant physical advantage over John. He is bigger, tougher, and stronger. In addition, Dave holds a senior position in a biomedical company, while John is an artist. I believe that no matter what happens, Dave will refrain from physically harming me, which will allow me to keep him at a distance while John makes his escape. When I heard the familiar sound of Dave's car pulling into the driveway, I was overwhelmed by a wave of anxiety. My stomach rumbled and my heart began to beat, urging me to gather my strength. I take a deep breath, trying to calm my nerves. I can't help but wonder what Dave thinks of the unfamiliar car parked on our driveway John's car. Memories of a cheating story that Dave once stumbled upon flood my mind, increasing my already rapid heartbeat. I have to keep my composure. I remind myself to stay calm when Dave's voice comes from the other side of the door and his eyes are fixed on John in surprise. Deciding not to show any discomfort, I stay seated, avoiding the need to greet Dave with a kiss in front of John. I noticed Dave's quick glance in my direction, indicating that he noticed my guilt. With confident steps, Dave approaches us and holds out his hand. A hint of concern appears on John's face as he realizes the significant size difference between him and Dave. Before I can say a word, Dave stands in front of John and holds out his hand. Dave? He introduced himself. John hesitates, his gaze fixed on Dave's hand. The handshake is short, and releasing his hand, Dave discreetly wipes his right hand on the back of his trousers. After spending so many years together, I understand the meaning of this gesture all too well. John sprawls on the couch, sinking into the soft pillows. His gaze shifts to the two glasses of Chardonnay neatly placed on the coffee table in front of him. In response, Dave gets up from his seat and heads to the kitchen, taking a cold beer out of the fridge. Sitting down on the couch, he opens the jar, takes a long sip, and puts it next to the glasses of Chardonnay. Now there is a triangular composition of three drinks on the table. My throat constricts, and anxiety runs through my veins, threatening to rattle my nerves like an overloaded branch. I force myself to look up and find Dave's questioning eyes fixed on me. Unable to hold his gaze, I look away, feeling uncomfortable. My attention is distracted by his worn jeans and relaxed polo shirt. I can't help but wonder how long it's been since he's been coming home in such casual clothes. Where did his work uniform go? Have they introduced an informal Friday policy? I mentally berate myself, realizing that now is not the time to ask banal questions about clothes. But this was the moment I was so afraid of. It was here that I destroyed the spirit of a man who embodied exemplary participation in society, exceptional fatherhood, and unwavering support as a husband. He was my first love, but unfortunately for him. Dave, we need to have a serious talk. I can feel the tension in the air, which sends goosebumps down my spine. His face remains impassive, betraying no emotion. He tends to stay calm in high-pressure situations. Unlike me, he likes to analyze the situation objectively. That is why I have replayed this conversation countless times in my head, considering all possible scenarios and developing a strategy for each of them. But now I have to solve the most important issue. Despite my confidence that I've thought of everything, I'm inexplicably nervous and sweating. Dave, I want to warn you right away that you haven't done anything wrong. I feel a tremor in my voice as I clear my throat, unable to meet his gaze. Throughout all the years that we have been together, our friends have been jealous of our marriage. It's obvious to them, as it is to me, that you are an exceptional husband. 
I try to soften the impending blow I'm about to deliver, but Dave doesn't smile back. I confess my concerns about the conversation I'm going to have with some of them. Let me explain. I'm afraid some of them won't be able to forgive themselves for hurting you. Even when I turn my attention to what is behind him, I still see that there is no trace of a smile or any softening in Dave's expression. Although his lips are moving, he looks like a motionless statue. Are you going to hurt me, Chelsea? The words are simple, but they have a certain power. I attract his gaze and finally meet his eyes. His gaze is unyielding and motionless, as if he is intently studying something on a microscopic glass. It breaks the spell, and I quickly look away, feeling awkward. Yes, I'm sorry, Dave. I regret to tell you that my feelings have changed, and instead I have developed an attachment to John. It is my intention to do you minimal harm, but I believe that a divorce is necessary to continue our relationship with John. When I pause after these words, I try to look behind your facade and imagine the huge conflict that must be tearing you apart from the inside. I expect to see visible signs of suffering, perhaps a throbbing temple, watery eyes, clenched lips, or fists. Surprisingly, there is no reaction. The lack of any reaction, or rather, the lack of it, inspires fear in me. My gaze involuntarily turns to the baseball bat. The unbearable silence consumes both of us, and I can't stand it anymore. I feel the urge to break it by rejecting a carefully prepared speech. It was never my intention to hurt you until it became inevitable. I hope you understand, Dave. John and I were extremely careful to avoid any signs that might lead you to believe the truth until it became absolutely necessary. Unfortunately, this meant shortening the time we spent together as I was genuinely worried about your emotions. It had a big impact on the moments that John and I could share. I avoid making eye contact with him, feeling that I can no longer deceive him. All my lies are exhausted, and I can no longer deceive this man. Respect for him prevents me from continuing to fabricate lies, but some part of me secretly hopes that he won't ask, won't be so blunt. The words that came out of his mouth only make the situation worse. I'm well aware that my silence speaks volumes, confirming all of Dave's suspicions. It seems that there is nothing more to say. There is no point in making another apology. I am ready to hurt Dave, fully aware of this, and he is also aware of my intentions. There's a creepy atmosphere in the room, and I'm desperately looking for a way out. The tension in the air is almost unbearable, making my nerves tense and my skin crawl. Although Dave does not outwardly express his pain by shouting, I feel that he must be suffering internally. In alarm and silence, I wonder which of the reactions I expect from him will follow. Regardless of his reaction, I foresee that it will be terrible and will become an obstacle that I must overcome in order to start a new life with John. It seems like time is dragging on while Dave is just looking at me. Excuse me, Chelsea, I must admit that my reaction to your request for a divorce is instant and uncluttered. So let me get this straight. You want to get divorced in order to marry a man whose name I don't remember right now. Is that right? Well, if that's what you really want, I won't stand in your way. I will try to maintain a calm demeanor devoid of any special emotions. At this point, I find myself unable to understand or respond. This answer, unexpected and completely unexpected, took me by surprise. It's like a sudden blow as a result of which I feel not only shocked, but also offended. This revelation is not accompanied by any questions, accusations or raised tones. There is no trace of embarrassment or sadness on my face, and there are tears in my eyes. Despite the fact that we have been together for 28 years, my husband does not seem interested in spending even five minutes on an interrogation. It took me months of agony to decide whether to continue the affair with John, and countless sleepless nights when I was afraid of this very moment. And yet, in less than 10 minutes, I was thrown away without any visible emotion on my husband's part. I really want to speak out, but I have to be careful. How can I break through Dave's emotional detachment without jeopardizing my relationship with John? It's a delicate balance, a fine line. But Dave, after all these years of living together, are you really ready to just leave? Chelsea, it's obvious that you've already emotionally pulled away from me. 
Why should we struggle to hold on? What else is there to fight for? Instead, perhaps we should cherish the memories we still have when we part ways. It's not the answer I was hoping for, but it's at least some kind of answer. Just as I'm about to ask another question, Dave interrupts me before I can find the words. I suppose you have documents that I have to sign, he says. And he's right, I have. The notarized divorce petition is actually in John's car. Tonight we had no idea that we would overcome violent outbursts, possible tears, and shifting the blame on Dave to the point that he would not even look at the papers, let alone sign them. Just as I'm about to react, John abruptly gets up and leaves the room. I watch him, realizing that the tension has affected him as well. When an uneasy silence reigns in the air after he leaves, I gather up the courage and apologize to Dave. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm truly sorry that I hurt you. Dave stands up, and my gaze involuntarily switches to the bat. No, Chelsea, you're not sorry, he replies. If you were really remorseful, you wouldn't have done this act the first time, he declares, and heads to the kitchen for a beer, effectively ending the discussion. When Dave returns to the living room, John is already there, awkwardly clutching a manila envelope on his belt. Dave hurries over to him, forcing John to retreat so quickly that he loses his footing and stumbles, his knees hitting the edge of the couch, throwing him off balance. He falls to the floor with a light thud, making me feel sorry for John. Dave remains holding the envelope, and John gives me a sidelong glance. His face turns red, and I can see in his eyes that he understands that he doesn't look his best in this situation. With just one look, I'm trying to convey to him that it doesn't matter to me, that I love him. But my attention returns to Dave, who is watching me with such a detached expression on his face that I cannot decipher his thoughts. And I remain in doubt about his intentions towards John. Dave, my friend Mary knows about our presence here, I inform him. If she doesn't hear from us by eight, I've told her to contact the police. If you're looking for someone to hold accountable, then put the responsibility on me, not John. It's you, Chelsea. I hold responsible for all the promises you made to me years ago, not John. I want to assure you that I have no desire to see him suffer any more than he already suffers. Why should John suffer? I'm confused. He looks about 30, but he decided to be with you. I look at him with a blank expression on my face, and Dave gives me a familiar look kinder and more patient. He looks at me the same way when he tries to explain something that I obviously don't understand. At the age of 50, this woman's inability to have children becomes a cruel sentence for the man she is dating, condemning him to a life without offspring and a sense of genetic inferiority. It is difficult to imagine a worse punishment for any man, because he will forever lose the deep joy of watching the first steps of his baby or experiencing that magical moment when he hears daddy for the first time. The simple pleasures associated with teaching your own child to catch a ball or ride a bike will remain alien to him. He will never have the opportunity to help with homework or guide a child through the process of learning to drive. After all, he won't have the opportunity to become a hero for his daughter or a role model for his son. It's unlikely that our children will keep in touch with you when they find out the truth about what you both did. A chill run through my veins, causing my blood to turn to ice. I tremble, realizing that I was so engrossed in hiding my infidelity and plotting the end of my marriage that I didn't think about how our children would react. Deep down, I'm afraid they might not want anything to do with me anymore. Putting aside my fears, I turn to Dave, hoping that he will not reveal the truth to them, but all he says is... Do you expect me to lie to them the same way you lied to me? I hang my head in shame, but what torments me most is the realization that he will marry someone he will never be able to fully trust. You used a lot of excuses, for example, saying that you were late at work or spending time with your girlfriends to secretly meet with him. What about you, Chelsea? When, after about five years, your appearance begins to fade and he remains a fit and young 40-year-old man, do you really think that he will hesitate and will not leave you? Think about it. By then, he will have noticed all your flaws. The way you get irritable for one week every month because of menstruation, which takes up 25% of your time. 
he will become aware of your loud snoring, reminiscent of the rumble of a freight train when you fall into a deep sleep. He will get tired of constantly refusing your requests, dear. When you ask about your appearance in tight jeans, he will soon realize how little effort you put into cooking a normal meal. He will witness your addiction to reality TV and the excessive amount of money you spend on cosmetics that promise eternal youth. Well, he'll find out all the other flaws soon enough. Furious, I stand up abruptly, ready to respond with harsh words. I remind myself that not only do I snore, but at least I have the ability to color coordinate. As I'm preparing to criticize Dave, I'm interrupted by John's sigh, and I freeze in place. I look at John and notice the realization on his face that some of Dave's remarks hit the nail on the head. I understand that I need to remove John from this situation. Dave shrugs his shoulders dispassionately, and I fall back onto the couch in complete shock. Anger and resentment overwhelm me as I wonder if that's really how he sees me and if he's really stuck to those thoughts all these years. I have an irresistible desire to speak out, but I can hardly find the right words. I kept my infidelity a secret for months to protect Dave, but now I feel a strong desire to make him understand how much pain he caused me by easily abandoning me. But I can't express my emotions watching Dave take a sip of beer and open the envelope. I look down at my hands, avoiding eye contact with John and desperately hoping he's not looking at me either. Half the value of the house, right? Dave mutters, looking at me. I don't think so, Chelsea. Before I met you, this property belonged to me. You may be able to escape with some of our common funds, but keep in mind that the amount may not be as significant as you think. When we break up, we will split our retirement accounts in half, it is quite likely but you won't get any share until my retirement, which is still 17 years away. Continuing to read the rest of the document, he gratefully falls silent. I can only hope that John's affection for me will prevail over the fact that our expected financial security will not materialize. The silence stretches on, seemingly endless. Eventually, Dave looks up. Everything seems quite reasonable, except for the house. But I'm sure your lawyer will charge exorbitant fees trying to challenge this issue. So what are our next steps? Well, I suppose you should get a lawyer. And we are... No, I mean, what are we supposed to do tonight, at this point in time? Well, I think I should pack some things. This is not an option I would prefer that you leave immediately, if we come back in two days. No, such a plan will not work. I'll have changed the locks by then. Maybe I'll deliver your stuff to John next weekend? If I miss something, feel free to email me. Just so you know, you can remove all the photos from the walls, except those that depict children. We can separate them separately, because I don't want them to remind me of you, but there is one exception. The photo of us on the cruise last year is closed to you. I can't help but wonder why this particular photo is so important to Dave, because it was taken about three months after the beginning of my affair with John. It was during an unexpected Caribbean cruise that Dave organized as soon as possible. At that time, I did not feel strong feelings of love for John and continued to maintain a full-fledged relationship with my husband. Despite this, the photo shows a woman who looks satisfied and happy after experiencing love. I can't understand why John only wants this picture. Thinking about this, Dave abruptly turns to John and addresses him directly for the first time. Do you still live at 42 Belmont? Dave asks. Suddenly I realize my mistake. No, I'm sorry, I forgot. You moved in a few months ago, didn't you? It's 58 Gravilia now, isn't it? If I hadn't been sitting, I would have fainted from shock. Dave was aware of it, he knew. And not only that, but also what he had known for at least four months. Despite all our efforts, it is difficult for me to comprehend the current situation. Memories of countless meals together, intimate moments, caring gifts, romantic evenings, and cherished events such as birthdays and anniversaries flash before my eyes. Every morning, evening, and day spent together, as well as the precious time we devoted to our children, and yet, in all these moments, I didn't notice a single hint of a change in Dave. It's like I'm looking at him with fresh eyes, like I'm seeing him for the first time. This is a man who has been by my side throughout my adult life, 
the man who stood next to me held my hand and provided constant support when I brought our children into the world. The man I took gentle care of during his struggle with the flu. This is the true essence of Dave, the one in which it is impossible to lift your head from the pillow. The person who took care of me in an emergency during morning sickness. A man who should be familiar to me like the back of my hand. A man I should be deeply connected to. Are there any noticeable changes? No, absolutely none. I look at him amazed, a complete stranger. The man I've been married to for 28 years is now an unfamiliar face. I used to think of myself as smart and careful, never revealing anything, a skilled actress. But Dave surpassed me. He is much superior to me. He knew everything and hid it from me. How could he? How did he manage to hide it so effectively? If his love for me was sincere, he shouldn't have done that. Just the thought of it causes a surge of strong emotions. I have no desire to delve into the reasons for this. If I really loved him, would I be able to hide it so skillfully? And yet it is obvious that my attempts to hide it have not been successful. Dave knew about it, had known for months. I look at him, but this is not the real version of him. On the contrary, this is him who was only two weeks ago. I imagine him undressing me with tenderness, affection, and devotion. But all this was just a facade. He knew. I think about how much effort I put into responding and hiding my guilt. I tried very hard to make my facial expression reflect love and care. I think about the tears I held back, silently apologizing to John when I engaged in physical intimacy, feigning desire and affection. The severity of the stress lingers in my mind, a constant struggle to suppress the desire to escape, to recoil. I deeply apologized to both men. I deceived and betrayed them both. Memories of countless similar situations flooded my mind, where my heart was beating not out of love or desire, but out of fear of being discovered. The weight of my lies causes me great anxiety and stress. I am constantly worried about the consequences of my deception, fearing that my true intentions will be revealed. It's been a constant struggle for months, because Dave knows about my actions. I choose my words carefully and watch my every facial expression, living in constant fear of being caught. I feel like my nerves are stretched to the limit, exhausted from the enormous effort spent trying to hide my betrayal and shield Dave from pain. The burden of tracking my lies has robbed me of sleep and my psyche. And yet it was all in vain. I can't help but wonder if he ever really loved me. How long had he been pretending? Just a month? Four? Fifteen? Or even twenty-eight long years? All those hurtful words he said to John reveal his true attitude towards me. When I look at him, tears come to my eyes, but he remains dry. It's me holding back tears, overwhelmed with anger and a heartbreaking sense of rejection. I reach for the Chardonnay, wanting to put out the fire and wash away the bitterness left in my mouth. Unfortunately, it has acquired a sour taste. Dave quickly snatches the glass out of my hand, while clutching John's half-empty glass in his other hand. He purposefully heads towards our kitchen, or rather, now his kitchen. Casually, as if having a casual conversation with a neighbor about the weather, he says, hurry up, Chelsea, John is already at his car. It's becoming obvious that I'm being ignored. I look over and notice that John has indeed left the room. Without thinking, he dumped me, ignoring our plan to leave together. It's been four years. I flip through the pages of the magazine, reach the end and realize that I can't remember a single article or advertisement. Perhaps it's not worth remembering, because the content is probably outdated. In search of confirmation, I glance at the cover and find the dates. It's depressing that I was right. The magazine is staggeringly short, three years old. One might assume that such a prestigious and popular medical practice as this could well afford current publications. As I put the book back in the stack and pick up another one, I wonder why meetings are always postponed. Engrossed in flipping through the board, I patiently wait for my turn. Mrs. Smith, I hear the name, but it doesn't immediately register. It's only after repeating it that I flinch, feeling a little stupid. 
Even four years later, it's still hard for me to get used to being addressed not as Mrs. Brown, but as Mrs. Smith. I get up, grab my bag, and head down the hall to the doctor's office. Hello, Mrs. Smith. The doctor greets me as I enter. How can I help you today? I want to replace my implant since it's been five years. Oh, I'm sorry I forgot. This is indicated in your appointment, so you're still interested in contraception. It may be worth discussing with your husband the possibility of him taking on some of the responsibility and considering a vasectomy. He smiles, and I reciprocate. Maybe in the future I think quietly to myself. Although I keep a friendly and neutral expression on my face, internally I feel a sense of satisfaction. The ongoing debate with John over his possible vasectomy has been a long and determined struggle. Why expose your body to harmful chemicals if there is a simple alternative procedure? Moreover, this procedure does not even require surgery in the hospital. It can be performed by a competent doctor here. On the contrary, a non-chemical option for me would be to tie up the pipes, which I have repeatedly told John about. During our recent argument about this, I remembered that John mentioned that he had had mumps as a child. Hoping to gain an advantage in our differences, I asked him to take a sperm test to determine if he had a low sperm count, thinking that if the results were positive, I would be able to stop using contraceptives. This determined man refused to take the test, which upset me. But, being no less stubborn, I decided to quietly collect some of their sperm and send it for examination, despite the fact that their offensive words remained in my memory. Surprisingly, I kept it properly, which seemed ironic to me. It turned out that John not only had a low sperm count, but also complete sterility. There was not a single sperm in his sperm. At first I felt triumphant and thought about showing him the results. But on reflection, I realized that it is better to give preference to a harmonious relationship than confrontation. I longed for intimacy and reunion with the happiness that we once shared. This is not just a release of sexual tension. I can't help but recall the inconveniences associated with monthly bleeding. Personally, I appreciate freedom from menstruation problems, which is why I choose an implant. Besides, it's not a permanent solution. My attention returns to Dr. Jones when I realize I missed what they were talking about. Apologetically, I ask them to do a replay. Dr. Jones suggests replacing my current implant with a new type of contraceptive implant, which they say is quite remarkable. It not only provides contraception, but also has additional benefits. In addition, this device periodically records your heart rate throughout the day and offers other recording functions. We use it for diagnostic purposes, allowing you to conveniently stop by one of our scanners if you feel unwell. By uploading the information, we can examine the state of your internal health since the previous visit. It's really wonderful, almost like something out of a futuristic show. However, I grin and think about the possible side effects. Will I suddenly grow in size, or will my mustache grow? Does it look like an implantin, which stops bleeding completely in most women? No, it's not like that at all. It is less destructive than implantin, but it provides similar benefits, for example. It reduces or at least minimizes copious spotting. Okay, that sounds promising. Dr. Jones turns his attention to the monitor and clicks on the icon on his home screen. Oh, what is it? He mutters. I look at him, then at the screen, curious about his puzzled tone. How long have you had an implant? He asks, turning to face me. Is it even possible? Are you sure? It looks like you already have an avant-garde implant. Your entire medical history has been uploaded. What? I ask, perplexed. You should have had the procedure within the last 18 months. It was for such a period that they were allowed and available. But I didn't do it. I haven't seen a doctor in over two years. He looks at the screen, and even from the side I notice how pale his face is. There is data for four years here, how is this possible? And why are there audio files among them? These are audio files. There must have been a glitch somewhere. It looks like someone else's vanguard was accidentally linked to your patient's card. However, it is puzzling that this confusion has been going on for four years. Also, I don't understand why I see a Google map with a checkbox pointing to the clinic. 
Let's check your implant and try to solve this problem. My head is spinning by the time I get to the examination bench and lie down. I turn my head away because I feel a little sick when it comes to needles and stuff like that. It's definitely Vanguard, he confirms, and I can hear the confusion in his voice. The new implant is slightly larger and wider, but otherwise identical to the ones we normally use. I turn my head to the doctor, who compares my implant with the image on the screen. Looking at the top of the page, I notice the word, Vanguard Ian. It brings back memories in me. I remember that name someone wrote under that pseudonym on an amateur website where Dave read about unfaithful wives. It just seems like a coincidence. The rest of the reception is a blur. The doctor calms me down, saying that we will figure out the problem. It must be some kind of cross-signal or malfunction of your previous implant. After paying the bill, I head to my car. As I grip the steering wheel, snatches of past conversations flash through my head. Thoughts about recent events are haunting. In addition, there is a clause in my contract according to which all my research and inventions belong to the company, which means that I will not be able to patent anything that I work on at home for at least a year after I leave. Dave has always considered research and innovation to be the most enjoyable aspect of his job. Remembering our conversations, I vividly imagine him sitting on the couch opposite John and me. In my imagination, he is wearing faded jeans and a regular polo shirt, his typical outfit. But then my memories move on to another memory that left me confused and disappointed. It was when we had to divide the property, and I was struck by the meager amount in our savings account. What struck me even more was that Dave insisted on keeping a framed photo from the Caribbean cruise we went on together, just three months after my affair with John began. The realization hit me like a thunderclap, and I felt my hands fall limply into my lap. Interestingly, it was during this cruise that I recently underwent an implant procedure. At Dave's suggestion, I decided to switch doctors and clinics so that our vacation would not be disrupted by any inconvenient monthly visits. I was deeply touched by my husband's foresight. Looking back at the clinic, I noticed that it was different from the one I had visited before. I not only changed my doctor, but also chose a completely different clinic. This decision was made after Dave and I broke up, as our previous doctor, who was a close friend of Dave's father, inspired Dave to pursue a career in medical research. It would be too inconvenient and embarrassing to continue treatment with Dr. Black, given the circumstances. Dave must have known about John's actions all along, and the thought makes my heart sink. It seems he convinced Dr. Black to implant a device designed by Dave himself, called Vanguardia. However, mine had additional features that seem intrusive and potentially against the law, including a GPS locator and the ability to record voice. I definitely did not give my consent to such invasive functions. Although I vaguely remember signing something, I don't remember the details. Regardless, I think I should file a lawsuit against Dr. Black since I had absolutely no idea what I was signing. I know that he has retired and currently lives in Brazil, since his wife is from there and is much younger. But I'm not sure if he can be extradited from Brazil. It seems unlikely that its sole purpose is to track my movements. As I thought further, it suddenly dawned on me that such technology could be very valuable for the military. Indeed, its potential use in military operations cannot be ignored. I know that Dave was instrumental in creating a revolutionary solution for soldiers with diabetes, an implant that effectively regulated blood sugar levels without the need for daily injections or medication. Given this achievement, it is logical to assume that the development of a GPS locator and recorder would not pose a serious problem for him. The potential of this new venture is overwhelming and exciting. Apparently, Dave made the decision to quit his job around that time or shortly after our cruise. This discovery sheds light on our meager savings account as he used it to support our living expenses. Unfortunately, I have not taken the initiative to investigate this issue. I use my credit card regularly and Dave generously covered the monthly payments and gave me cash for tips, markets, and other expenses. Thanks to his help, I never had to visit ATMs or pay bills online, as Dave always took on these tasks himself. The photo from our cruise, which Dave personally framed, made me wonder if it was relevant in connection with his resignation. 
Nevertheless, I dismissed the idea that it could be an implant scanner, although deep down I suspected that it was. This suspicion was reinforced by Dave's suggestion to put the photo in the hallway near the hangar and his unwillingness to let me keep it. He knew that I would either redo the thing or give it to one of the children who might accidentally discover its true purpose. The extent to which I was deceived is simply staggering. It all seems incredibly unusual, like something out of a Jason Bourne or James Bond movie, but deep down my instincts tell me that it's true. Every last detail. It feels like my chest is being squeezed tightly, making it difficult to breathe. Unsurprisingly, he did not seek revenge during the divorce proceedings. He has already achieved his goal, at least financially, and there's nothing I can do about it. It is unlikely that I will be able to contact Dr. Black. Given Dave's cunning nature, I have no doubt that he somehow managed to get my signature on the consent form. This is all the more frustrating because it has been almost four years since our divorce was finalized. Although I am entitled to a portion of his retirement funds, I strongly suspect that he is transferring his substantial income from Vanguardian through various corporate structures, leaving me penniless. Disappointed, I absently touch the hand that holds the new implant. I can't even trust John. Our family situation is already unstable and revealing how thoroughly my ex-husband is cheating on me will only make the situation worse. Even worse, Dave now lives in the Algarve. The children enthusiastically talk about his villa by the sea, although such conversations do not happen often. When I drive up to the modest and dilapidated cottage that John and I share, my mind is clouded and I can't remember the way home. I silently pray that I will not miss a single red traffic light as I cannot bear the thought of violating traffic rules in addition to today's stunning revelations. In a daze, I mechanically unlock the door and enter the living room where John is sitting on the couch. Hesitantly, he begins, Chelsea, we need to talk. At this moment, I notice his clasped hands with a young woman who looks no more than 30 years old, but she's clearly pregnant. Her due date must be coming soon. To my surprise, there are two glasses of Chardonnay on the table in front of them.